Hey guys, welcome back to another video. It's been a while and I do apologise for the lack of content. This was mainly because I wanted to focus on school and my exams, but luckily now that is finished for the year, so I'll have a lot more free time to focus on the channel. For today's video, I want to do another tips and tricks, but this time I don't want it to be only about the terrain system, but rather I want to cover a whole range of areas. So I guess you could call this a generic tips and tricks for achieving realistic graphics in Unity? Yeah, that'll do. So sit back, relax, grab some snacks, and enjoy. Post-processing is a necessity for old projects if you don't want your graphics to look flat and lifeless. So to add post-processing, navigate to Window, Package Manager, Post-processing. Next you'll have to create a unique layer which will tell the camera what post-processing volume to use. Next you'll need to add the post-processing layer to your main camera and under layer select the unique layer you just created. Then select an anti-aliasing method. And finally, create a new game object, rename it to something like Post Processing Volume, and add the Post Processing Volume script, and change the layer to the unique layer you created earlier. Then enable is global. That is all the setup work required. You can now click a new profile to create a new post processing profile, which is used to actually apply the various effects. If any of this is confusing to you or too fast, I recommend you watch my post-processing video which is an in-depth look into the entirety of the post-processing system. For your profile, there are two components which I believe are a necessity for every project, and they are ambient occlusion and colour grading. Ambient occlusion will provide greater fidelity to your shadows and lighting. while color grading provides powerful tools to adjust the look and feel of your visuals in a more artistic way. I would recommend under Tone Mapping to select the Aces preset. This will provide a more filmic appearance. You'll find that the lighting becomes darker. To fix this, just increase the post exposure value to something like 1. These modifications are how I start most of my post processing profiles, and I recommend you do likewise, since this provides a great foundation to build up from. When you walk outside or into a bright room from a darker space, you may notice that upon the initial exposure, the light seems extremely bright, but then after a few seconds, you begin to adjust to the new light levels. This is called eye adaptation, and we can actually achieve the same effect using post-processing. This effect will greatly increase the realism of your scene. To set this up, you need to add the eye adaptation component to your post-processing profile. Then, increase the slider of the filtering component to cover the entirety of the slider. Then move the min and max EV to the far left and far right. Finally, adjust the exposure compensation to a value that you want your base sliding to be at. 0.5 is generally a good value for daytime scenes. When creating a natural terrain, ensure that you include variations in the height to create greater interest. This is especially important around larger mountains. Having strong deviations in height will allow the mountains to feel more organic and connected to the world. Additionally, this will also provide performance benefits due to frustrum culling. A good way to set this up is to create the terrain variations before creating the larger mountains.
Continuing on the terrain topic, another important factor to consider is background detail. In a mountainous scene, if you include additional mountain peaks in the distance, the entire space will feel more believable. Note that these background details do not need to be of high quality, as the player should never be able to get close to these additions. An easy way to create background details is to create a new terrain system and sculpt a single mountain or simple mountain range, and then position this around the main terrain. This option is generally better than using assets of the store, because you can ensure that the style and colouring matches your main terrain. When you add grass to your terrain, you should set the healthy and dry colours to white, or at least close to white if you want some deviation in colour. However, even with this change, you may notice that your grass changes colour occasionally during runtime. This is a unity thing that is supposed to mimic the illusion of wind blowing through the grass blades. However, often I find this colour change too extreme or just distracting. So, if you want to get rid of this effect, go into the train settings and navigate to the wind settings for grass section, and change the grass tint colour to grey. This will completely remove the effect. If you want the effect to still have a slight presence, adjust the colour slightly from the base grey colour. Textures are an important element of any game, and a good texture consists of more than just an albedo map. You should be including normal, occlusion, height, specular maps, and so on for optimal results. However, it can be difficult to obtain all these different maps for a texture. If you know how to use 3D modeling software like Blender, you can create a high resolution mesh of your object and then bake those details into the various maps to use on your lower resolution model. I'll include a link to a Blender tutorial in the description below if you're interested in this. However, not all of us are 3D modelers, so is there another way? Well, luckily yes, there is another way, to create these textures relatively easy using Materialize, a free software that allows you to generate additional map from an initial albedo map. I'll include a link to this software in the description below as well as a tutorial on the topic. However, note that directly baking these maps from an actual mesh will always provide superior results. A reflection probe is essentially a second camera that captures a 360 view of its surroundings. This captured view can then be projected onto surrounding game objects to add realistic reflections and overall improvements in lighting. However, please be aware that reflection probes can be performance heavy. To create a reflection probe, navigate to Game Object, Light, Reflection Probe. A reflection probe has an area of effect, represented by the bounds indicated under Box Size. You can manually alter the values in this section, or click the Edit Bounds Volume tool to physically scale the bounds to your needs. Reflection probes can either be baked, which means that Unity will pre-calculate the reflection data before runtime, which causes the probe to have essentially no impact on performance. This is only useful when a scene is static, meaning that nothing changes, i.e. no changes in lighting, object positions, etc. Another option is real-time, which will not pre-calculate any reflection data and instead calculate during runtime. This will have an impact on performance, but allows a scene to be dynamic allowing for objects to move, lighting to change, etc. When selecting real-time, you may notice additional options appear. This allows you to fine-tune how often the reflection probe updates its reflection data. By default, it is set to on awake. This means that the reflection probe activates once when the game first starts. This is not good if your scene is dynamic, so you'll have to change this to every frame. But this can be extremely expensive in terms of performance, so if you need to improve your FPS, I would recommend choosing the via scripting version, and then create a simple script that allows you to update the reflection probe on a set interval. Reflection probes also provide a custom option, which allows you to apply a pre-existing cube map.
Other important settings to consider are importance, which if two reflection probes affect the same object, then the one with the highest value of importance will be chosen over the other. Intensity essentially amplifies the reflection probe effect. Generally, you just keep this at the default value of one. Finally, resolution allows you to set the resolution of the captured cube map. The higher the resolution, the higher the performance cost. Only choose a higher end resolution if you want the clarity in extremely reflective materials, like a mirror object or puddle object, to be crisp. Otherwise, a lower end resolution will be good enough to get the overall colouring and lighting improvements. Reflection probes are good and all, but they can be limiting since they generally are stationary, which can cause strange reflections to occur if the player camera is not in line with the reflection probe itself. However, there is a way to achieve realistic reflections, and it is to use the post-processing component screen space reflections. The feature uses the player camera to calculate the necessary reflections. The options for this component are fairly self-explanatory, and you'll mainly just be working with the different presets. Like reflection probes, screen space reflections will have a large performance cost, but luckily you can still gain a noticeable improvement even with the lowest preset. For screen space reflections to work, you need to be using the deferred rendering pathway. You can set this pathway by navigating to Edit, Project Settings, Graphics, Untick Default, and then select Deferred under Rendering Path. Alternatively, you can just change it on the camera game object under Rendering Path. Like reflection probes and screen space reflections, light probes can also improve the lighting fidelity of your scene. But unfortunately, you rarely see people using this tool, mainly due to how complex it looks. But trust me, once you know how it operates, you'll be using them all the time. So let's have a quick introduction. Light probes store baked information about light that passes through empty space. In other words, you'll be able to capture bounce light in your scene. To create a light probe group, navigate to Game Object, Light, Light Probe Group. A light probe group consists of a series of probes that indicate sections that are gathering lighting information. The closest probe to a game object will have the largest effect on that object's lighting. You can adjust the location of these light probes by clicking Edit Light Probes, and then clicking on the light probe you want to adjust. The color should turn blue if selected. You can also create a new light probe by clicking Add Probe. Or alternatively, use the shortcut keys Ctrl C and Ctrl V to copy and paste a probe. In a project, you usually use many light probes in order to capture as much lighting information as possible, but as a rule of thumb, you want to place probes where there is a clear difference in lighting and colour. Volumetric lighting, also known as gourd rays, allows beams of light to be visible. This can add greater interest to your lighting and overall realism, if used correctly and not overdone. My eyes! Additionally, volumetric lighting is a great way to draw emphasis. HDPR has built-in volumetric lighting, however for standard Unity you'll have to use imported assets to achieve the effect. Luckily, there are free packs out there such as Aura, and volumetric lights for Unity 5 by Slightly Mad. I'll have links to all these assets in the description below. I won't be going over how to use these assets as that deserves its own video. However, I will mention that volumetric lighting is not just for beams of light. They can also create an atmospheric fog effect, which will cause scenes set at sunrise and sunset to really pop. 
I'll be sure that in future follow along level design videos we will explore this technique. Decals are simply textures and materials that are projected onto another surface. The main purpose of decals is to add additional small details to an environment, like coffee cup stains on a table, puddles on a street, and of course bullet holes. A simple and easy way to create a decal in Unity is to use a textured quad. You can create a quad game object by navigating to Game Objects, 3D Object, Quad. Next, create a material with the decal you want to add to your environment. Ensure that the texture you are adding is transparent, aka a PNG or equivalent. Next, ensure to select Fade from the Rendering Mode options. Finally, apply the material to the created quad and place the quad in the necessary locations. It's also good to disable any colliders on the quad and also turn off cast shadows in the mesh renderer. If you want to place decals on curved surfaces, you'll not be able to use this technique and will instead require a proper decal system. Luckily there are some basic systems on the asset store for free. I'll link these in the description below. So that does it for this video, I actually had another tip prepared to do with composition and how you could position game objects in your environments to create emphasis and overall direct player's movement and behaviour. But that section was getting way too large so I'll rather release that as its own separate video. So make sure to keep an eye out for that upload if you're interested. If you have any other graphical tips be sure to leave a comment below. And if there is any type of video in particular you would like me to make let me know as well. As you guys know, I am very active in the comment section and it is always awesome to read your comments. So with that being said, thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next one.